fiction writer K. Srinata from Chennai is a professor of English at IIT Madras. Her poetry collections include The Unmistakable Presence of Absent Humans, just her new book, Book Martins, The Oasis, Writing Octopus, Arriving Shortly, and Sea Blue Child, which I was fortunate to publish long, long ago, The Brown Critic. The novel, uh, she's also a novelist, A Table for Four, which was published by Penguin India, was long listed in 2009 for the Man Asian Literary Prize. Srilata was awarded the first prize in the All India Poetry Competition organized by the British Council and the Poetry Society India, uh, in 1998. She was also awarded the Unison British Council Poetry Prize 2007 and the Gauri Madunga Poetry Prize again. <laughs> That's my mother's name actually, 2001. She's the editor of Anthologies, The Rapids of a Great River, the Penguin Book of Tamil Poetry, short fiction from South India published by OUP, All the Worlds Between, a collaborative uh, poetry project between India and Ireland, Yoda Press, and uh, many others. So I'm just skipping a little bit there. And um, Srilata was writer in residence at Sangam House, India, uh, Yon Hui Art Space Seoul, and the University of Stirling in Scotland. Over to you, Srilata. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Gayatri, and thanks to Anju and to Guruji of Kairagram for this uh, amazing venue. Pondicherry is a very special place for me because this is where I used to flee from my two young children at the time uh, if I wanted some headspace to write and think and read and so on. And Orville is a really special place also. So thank you. And it's also special because Gayatri Majundar, who is the editor of Brown Pretty, published my first collection, Sea Blue Child, way back. Uh, so it comes back full circle for me. I'll uh, start by reading a few poems from my latest collection, The Unmistakable Presence of Absent Humans. Uh, maybe I'll close with one poem from Sea Blue Child. So there is no general grand narrative connecting all these uh, poems, but that's how it seemed to me till the collection came together. And it turned out then, in retrospect, that many of these poems spoke of absences uh, at the personal level, also in a sense, you know, certain things just disappearing from this country, like ideas of democracy and secularism, which I felt deeply troubled about. Um, so these are really poems of absences, some of which I'll read to you now. It is 1966. I'm not born. My father knocks on the door of a house I have never seen. There at the door stands my mother, slender, a sprig of jasmine in her hair. I take a taxi to the park where they are sitting on a bench, a foot apart from each other, he with his face resolutely averted, she with her eyes on the poorly tended flowers. It is the beginning, I know, of that great quarrel. My mother, no longer a new bride, the edge of her sari already a grieving afterthought. She doesn't see me. She sees only the crumble of her years. I am to hold forever the grating harshness of it all. I walk up, older already than them both. Tell them I am their only daughter. And will they please, please look at each other, the way they had the day he had knocked on the door and she had let him in, jasmine in her hair. My mother looks at the flowers, the crumble of her ears, my father away from us both. So this poem is called What Penelope Said to Ulysses on His Return. And so you ask what I have been doing with myself these past 20 years, whether I have missed you and how much, and how I have fared all told. That first one year I heard all over, your absence leashed into my bones and dimmed the sun that insisted on rising each morning. When they brought Telemachus to me, I turned away, refusing to take him in my arms. How could I when he looked so much like you? The ache in my bones, the dimming of the sun, my turning away from Telemachus, these are easy to conjure up, but not so the rest. Soon my fingers became birds, I sent off to look for words I can weave into this poem. I'm writing even as we speak. But I'm growing less and less hopeful. The words I weave by day, I unweave by night. 
but I find they won't do. 20 years of missing you, Ulysses, and the trees for each year are still in hiding, an entire forest of them, out there somewhere beyond the flight of birds. Sita. I'm not gone yet, she whispers to the boys as they sleep, and even though it looks as though I walked out on it all, and even though it's what I wanted most of the time, to return to the earth, to leave it all behind in a grand gesture, I find I have been outwitted after all. For the going away is easy, but the leaving behind isn't. This keeping vigil has become a habit impossible to kick. And you, my boys, are my very heart. Tell your father, I'm neither golden image nor ghost. I'm that mother's face which looks back at him from all the palace mirrors, flame scarred and bright. Siamese twin. Do you remember the day it rained like it would never stop? And you and I on Mango Hill, watching her cling to her stillborn, and me wondering in my swimming head, which one of them is dead, dead? Both of us thinking Siamese twins, with our common seeing, dreaming eyes, and you saying too quickly, such love is common in the monkey world. Such love, such love. The phrase like a loaded gun, and both our hands on the trigger. Looking for light, sunbirds. Looking for light, sunbirds hop on hopeful, spindly legs. I'm no different. The same distaste of darkness and at dusk the same torment of light fading. Often the only light to be had is desperate and feeble, too deep to access. My body, a vanishing sun from which I must rescue that one sweet ray or remain forever bereft. Father. Sometimes I say I'm going to meet my father at the park, even though I have no father, just because it makes me like those others I knew with their moms and dads. My father left my mother when I was two, but he still loves me. My father left my mother for another woman when I was two, but once a week we meet in the park. He buys me cotton candy and sometimes we read a poem or two together. Today, I left my office in the pouring rain just to meet him, just to eat that cotton candy which he insists always on buying me. And every night, I dream of him with a cotton candy beard. And the beard becomes the most important word in the poem I have always wanted to write. I've forgotten my phone. I'm carrying a book of world poetry in translation. In it, there's a poem title, China Observed Through Greek Rain and Turkish Coffee. I imagine my father reading it and smiling into his beard. June drizzle and the park is glistening, not a sign of the cotton candy man. Perhaps after all, he doesn't exist. Perhaps he is like my father's beard, the feel of it on my young girl's skin. There's another man at the park, a solitary like me, except he seems to know why he's there. He must wonder what I'm doing here in this rain. Perhaps he thinks I'm waiting for a lover, an illicit lover even. A lover who can't be relied upon. I rehearse the words to say to him just in case. My father left my mother when I was two, but he still loves me. My father left my mother for an other woman when I was two, but once a week we meet in the park. He buys me cotton candy and sometimes we read a poem or two together. And he will not know how to respond. As I leave the park, I watch a man who might be my father make his heavy way to the bus stop. He stops a while, as though, waiting for a daughter. And then I see her, a woman about my age, walk towards him, take his arm, the two of them drowning under the fuss of the umbrella he unfurls over their heads. Okay, here's a poem that will kind of break the mood a little. It's called Learn From Me, How To Make Pickles, and it's a poem for my mother-in-law, also about my mother-in-law in some ways. And since he's a Bombay man with an Avakai heart, Mother-in-law stands on creaking knees and says, the hope still alive in her eyes, do you want me to teach you how to make them? Mango pickles of various sorts, avakai, mangai. Let me show you how to pluck the mangoes before they fall in summer, the shapes and sizes in which to slice them, and just how to subdue them in what spicy, salty, oil pools. It isn't hard, woman, you who sit at your desk all day long and read and write, have caught you often staring out the window. Learn from me how to make pickles. 
and sashay without a stumble into my son's heart. Wrap your fingers around kitchen knives, not pens. Books aren't bad, I know, but there is nothing and nothing the matter with pretty views. But they are nowhere close to pickles when it comes to certain things I should know. I've lived on this earth longer than you and have three grown children all raised on pickles. But first things first, the chili should always be a bright guntur red. <laughs> A woman of letters. Some days, what I want is to be a woman of letters, to retire to my study and be solitary. I can see it all, that desk, neat, rectangular, coffee brown, its drawers, selective and deep, holding secrets from another age. On it, some paper, a pen and an inkwell. And a bookcase filled with every kind of book. Austin, definitely, and Dickinson and Chuktai. No adolescent daughters abandoning dresses in contentious heaps. No grubby sons, their dirty socks like bombs under my books. No spouses, no mothers, no mothers-in-law with their urgent thoughts. Sometimes all I want is to be a woman of letters. Between chores, the very idea makes me be. England, 1999. It turns out that my hostess is a wonderful woman, kind, house-proud and gracious in the extreme. I couldn't have asked for more. She hovers around me like a small butterfly, pointing out the songbirds, the excessively clear skies, air crisper than fresh toast, the cheerful cows bursting with good health and milk, and the trees. And then she pops it, the question I've been dreading all along. So what's it like in India? We, we are a developing nation, as you know, I say beginning badly. Soon I'm selling the country for less than a song. Our cities are full of building trees, their leaves covered in dust. You're lucky if you see a bird. The air is always hot with smoke. Our cows are parchment thin and our skies, no one has the time for them. All along, I'm holding back another story, a story I don't know how to tell. An interior shadow story, and this is how it goes. Back home, laughter can spring unexpectedly from last night's trash. People steal the skies from themselves in the early hours of dawn. Every day they eke out color, weave the sparkle of diamond needles into silk, create the perfect ordinary geometry of columns for ants to feed off, for feet to trample on. These and a million other beautiful things our people do daily. All along, I'm sitting on a dormant volcano of a lie. Our naked babies crawl off the streets and into the embrace of their mothers. Beggars are only expect. Women and minorities are safe and caste is dead. Long after I've said my goodbyes, I dream of visiting on my gracious hostess this shadow story, that volcano lie imploding within. Okay, so this poem is for Atta Muhammad, who's a grave digger and caretaker of unmarked graves in northern Kashmir. And he used to basically just spend his time taking care of unclaimed bodies on both sides of the huge war, the ongoing kind of unrest and war. Um, he passed away a few years ago. This poem is for him. I bury them under the witnessing yellow of the chinar. I bury them under the witnessing yellow of the chinar. Blood moon faces yet to taste the sweetness of youth. Beards just beginning to show false fake encounters, scarred bodies of great importance to someone somewhere. Sons whose mothers will never find them. Infants, young girls with torn vaginas and dreams in their eyes, I bury them all, and the blood in my veins grows still. I have spent my hours naming the disappeared, the dead, the forever gone, uttering prayers over each new grave. I have spent them weeping, and the chinar trees have wept with me. Under the same chinar, my old, happy self lies buried. A friend teases. Muhammad, you've gotten rather good at this burying business, haven't you? He's right. I'll bury anything that makes its way to me. What I cannot bury is the remember. I'll conclude with a, just one poem from his first book that Gayatri published. It's really special for me and I think she set me off on more books and more writing. Uh, so I'll read the title poem. It's called Sea Blue Child and I will read uh, Sea Blue Child. Very, very short poem. Sea blue child, 
As a child, I liked the blue of the sea, sea blue frocks, sea blue happy, sea blue quiet, and languid seashells. Hyphenated, visually one. I even asked a father who never cared for a sea blue frock, flowing with frills like the sea. Thank you.